Hello. Hello. Hello, mate. Are you well? Good. How are you? I'm good. Have, have they put you up in the loft? <laughs> yeah, I've been locked in for four months now. <laughs> How are you doing? Yes, I'm good. I'm good. I'm uh, good. I thank you for doing this. I really appreciate uh, what you're doing. I'm just trying to find how you described yourself, which is the lightest touch. Just can you imagine? I, I had Paul Herman and, and Carl Swansbury, and it was about four pages long. Let me just go and find it. One sec. <laughs> it was it was hilarious. I can imagine. I've got to get Carl <laughs> on TV. I, I can't get. I couldn't get Carl off the phone as well. It literally just rambled on an absolute good. Yeah. Uh, um, have you been busy, by the way? Uh, yeah, I've been busy on. I've been busy. Busy on various things. Quite a lot of internal stuff to be busy on, and a lot of clients just want to chat and some new business as well, actually. So it's not something too bad overall. Um, do you think it's uh, well? Is there cash out in the market right now? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Private equity are definitely looking to spend. And, and is that looking for distress targets or or sort of strategic aims? Not really. Not really. I mean, there are some specialist distress funds, but you know, in the main, um, mid market private equity are doing what you'd expect them to do, really. So, COVID resilient businesses that are growing with good potential, blah blah blah. They're you know they're to put some money behind, and their portfolio companies that are you know feeling strong out of this are looking to consolidate. Not necessarily recruitment. You know, recruitment human capital is difficult, but across lots of other sectors, particularly healthcare, life sciences, tech, tech enabled, data, analytics, all of that stuff. There's loads of money placing opportunities there. Oh really? Okay, that's interesting. That's really interesting. Um, yeah, so that I've got a client at the moment that's a um, really cool business, does um, online training around health and safety and workplace compliance. Um, turns over 10 to 12, makes four and a half to five of EBITDA, so quite a nice business. Yeah. I've had 61 inbound approaches on it as the market started to hear about it. Shut up. 61. That's a, that's have, a you, record. have you seen that, that new thing that uh, Blue Box uh, Velocity? That's like a month uh, old. You, you checked it out? I haven't checked it out. No, I've heard about it, but I haven't checked it out. 1,500 quid a lead. 1,500 quid for 40 leads. And then you have to chase out your own leads. I mean, that's, that's ridiculous, isn't it? That's... Um, um, Entrepreneurial, but yes. unlike the yes. <laughs> yeah, I totally get that. Yeah, um, we won't be subscribing. Leading M and A advisors, mid market, the, uh, the longest track record of advising founders and management across the human capital sector. Yeah, Are you all right? With that? I went punchy. Is that all right? Yeah, perfect. That's yeah. brilliant. I didn't think um, it was so. Right. I, so I just thought we've, we've got a couple of questions that we just kind of frame this around. So have, hopefully you're happy with them. Um, yeah. uh, really interested again to get your, your sentiment on what businesses can do if they're, they're looking to do this, to do anything like this, when to yeah. get involved in someone like yourself. Um, so, you know, as soon as possible um, to help shape businesses, I'm guessing. Um, yeah. And then just talk about where the market is. You know, if I open up with a question of where's the M&A space, specifically around the staff and human capital, that'd be quite interesting. Um, and then just ask how you are, if that's all right. It's just, you know, make it a bit personal and relaxed. Is that okay? Yeah, personal relaxed is always good. Um, yeah, good. so, so the, gig, the gig, we're trying to do this in 20 minutes, so punchy short, um, yeah. nothing, nothing too de detailed or drawn out with a view at the end of it, we'll look at what content we've got. We'll look at either merge them into um, sort of the best of bits and the most of the best device, or we have standalone pieces, but we'll just see where we get with the content and, and how we can edit. Uh, yeah. but if you trust us, if there's, I'll show it back to you before we go with it. If there's anything that you're not happy with, then we just change. Is that yeah. fair? Yeah, all fair. But again, th thank you very much for doing this. If you don't mind, I've got a little random ramble I need to do before I just introduce you. So if you're all right with that, yeah, I'm brilliant. Good. And I need to do a clapboard so my editor knows when I'm starting. Otherwise, all this bullshit bit gets involved. Yeah. Uh, right, so brilliant. Uh, welcome, LinkedIn, to another one of our sessions where we're talking to really influential, meaningful people who add value to the recruitment sector. So following on from RDLC in lockdown, 
We really enjoyed that interview set, uh, program. So we're doing another one now on M&A and how recruitment business leaders can maximize shareholder value. Um, it's all about you know, recruitment business leaders, set up a business, and then look straight away for the exit. Sometimes that's a good thing. Sometimes it's a distraction. But why don't we talk to experts about it to give us some sort of insight? Now, today I'm delighted. Uh, Marcus Archer is a mate of the RDLC. Um, he's lunch with my gang individually. He gives us loads of advice. Um, Dean thinks he's the Don, so that gives you a great, great sentiment. Um, as opposed to giving me war and peace about his history, he's given me one line. So that, that, that reeks of confidence. Um, so let me introduce my mate, Marcus Archer. The leading, um, I'm gonna say the, the leading m and advisor in the mid-market, a long track record of advising founders and management teams on transactions in the human capital sector. Um, if it's to do with um, exiting in the human capital sector, Marcus is your go-to man. So without further ado, can I introduce my mate, Marcus Archer? Thanks, Gary. <laughs> <laughs> it's just still so laid back. It's brilliant. Before we start, Marcus, I haven't seen you for donks, mate. How have you been? How's life? How's lockdown been for you? It's been uh, it's been interesting. Um, you know, we've all had to adapt to doing ways in you know things in different ways, and you know, thank goodness for technology. I think if this had happened um, in the global financial crisis, we wouldn't know what to do. Um, but actually, with you know, two, two Zoom teams, all of those different tools, communicating with people. And it's actually been quite efficient. You know, interesting. I found I'm, I'm getting through more in my day, more meetings, more calls, covering more ground um, by doing it this way than traveling around London or around the country, meeting people face to face. And you know, building on existing relationships is, you know, works really well on this platform. Building new relationships is harder because you can't read the room and the body language. But actually, that piece of work has been great. Um, and I've got loads more family time as well, which has been really nice because you know, in, in the old days, pre-COVID, it was probably less time at home than than it should have been. So it's been quite nice to have more family time through this period as well. Do, do you think you're going to balance that better going forward? Yeah, I think so. I think so. I think, you know, three, three to four days a week in the office and one to two, two days a week working at home, you know, it's probably a long-term balance of, you know, how we're going to work in the future. Um, That's and interesting. That yeah. Big shift from really running country on trains to Manchester and Birmingham all the time. Which is, and nobody wants to do that, right? Uh, okay. With, um, <laughs> yes, oh, so the monkeys in the north, I still love you. Uh, when it came, came to doing deals, did, did you have deals fall over with, with what was going on? Uh, did you manage to get deals uh, completing during that period of time? Or were you at a moment when you just, it, there was no panic? Uh, well, luckily for us, we had a really good quarter ending March. Um, you know, even around human capital, so we... We closed the deal with Spencer Ogden and MML in March. Um, and we also closed the sale of Learning Curve, which is a, a government funded training business in March as well, um, around this human capital space specifically. So we, we were pretty good in terms of getting things done before this hit. Um, what's happened since then is um, a fewfold really. So our debt guys have got quite busy helping our clients access government support, um, particularly private equity clients, but also owner managed clients. Um, we had three deals that rolled into COVID world, all of which have now completed, uh, you know, which was great. Um, our origination guys are finding it um, a really interesting market because people just want to talk. Um, so we've, we're meeting about 40 new businesses a month, uh, mainly on a Zoom or a Teams platform to start that relationship build with new friends, uh, which has worked really well. Um, we've pitched about 25 times for new client business, uh, which is probably more than we were doing on a run rate basis before COVID. Um, and actually for the more COVID resilient businesses that we've been working with as pre, pre-existing clients, the ones that we've just won, um, the levels of business are probably about half speed of where they were before, but we're, we've got somewhere between 25 and 30 live M&A mandates on at the moment. So versus market, we feel, you know, busy and okay, um, except it's hard to get stuff done. So, so the, the businesses that, uh, that you're pitching for, as, as no, generic, um, are they businesses that are, are doing well, they're on the right trajectory, that they're, they're fit for purpose and you're gonna get a maximum multiple, or have you got a, a blend of businesses that are quite distressed um, or businesses where the CEO has just said, all right already, enough. What, what's, the, what's the balance? Uh, very little distress uh, or special situations. Um, you know, I think our view and you know, the view of the insolvency practitioners around town would be um, you know, that particular 
theme of deal activity will come later in the year and next year so as furlough unwinds or people have to pay their tax or pay their rent um, unfortunately businesses are going to feel a bit more pain later in the year and next so that's not really coming yet uh, most of the clients that we've got will be in I'll use the phrase COVID resilient because it's a bit of a buzz phrase but that means businesses that have traded at least flat through COVID um, and they tend to be in pharma, life sciences, healthcare, tech enabled businesses, virtual training businesses, um, you know, workplace compliance, health and safety, all of those are quite cool areas. Um, so for those businesses that want to go through an M&A transaction, either with a strategic trade bar or a private equity, uh, there's a real scarcity of high quality businesses like that. So there's a, a bit of a bun fight going on for them. Um, the other dynamic is smaller businesses that feel strong and feel like they can now consolidate. Um, so there's a lot of activity in people raising growth equity. And they're typically businesses making one to five million pounds worth of EBITDA that wouldn't have previously thought about M&A that were probably thinking about selling in a year. And they're actually thinking now, you know, actually I've done quite well through this. Now if I've got some deeper pockets and a bit of cash, I could go and make some M&A um, opportunities happen for me and become a much bigger, more exciting business and just push my exit plan out by a couple of years. Um, and there's a lot of private equity money looking at those type of opportunities as well. So it's a real. So, so, so it sounds like there's there's cash slushing around. Um, what does that cash look like, and 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 what would make a great target for the majority of it? Um, so the, the cash that's floating around, um, I would say, is predominantly sitting within private equity hands or debt fund hands. Um, the private capital is typically looking for cheap and distressed opportunities. Um, and I'd say a lot of the corporates are largely in, inward focused, still sorting out their core activities and probably sorting out a bit of rubbish in the portfolio. Um, so they're, they're not really in town in the way they were pre-COVID. So it's largely private equity funds in the mid-market that are looking for high quality businesses. You know, in recruitment world, that means niche and specialist. It means a high quality band with a good reputation. It means operating in an attractive market. And again, healthcare, life sciences, technology, renewables, infrastructure. Those areas are the, are the hotter ones and struggling less through this period. Uh, Long-term relationships with clients, well-spread client base, well-invested, scalable platform. Very, very importantly, a very good and proven management team that can show they've got a track record delivering growth. And right now, you've just tested your downside case for the last three or four months. So going into a business plan period where you've just worked through what you've just worked through you know, is a pretty powerful place to be. Um, and those that are embracing technology and using technology and disrupting with technology will be the ones that get a gold scar and be most attractive to, to those funds to invest in, I would say. And a, a lot of recruitment companies have, have got cash at the moment, surprisingly. You know, the, the government have, you know, have dug deep to, to, to support this, which has um, enabled an awful lot of business to shapeshift you know, yeah. from recruitment business into consultancy. Now, yeah. those businesses who are sort of heading in that direction where they get paid for their effort and not just their, 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 uh, their, their, um, their deals and, and um, uh, piecemeal, are those businesses going to become more attractive in that it's, it's recurring revenues um, more so, but it's a, it's a different beast. So it might not fit a traditional recruitment um, acquirer. But have people been asking for that or considering that? Um, they're probably still getting their heads around it, to be, to be honest. I think the dynamic of cash generative and highly visible earnings and using disruptive technology and working more virtual or att attractive traits um, I think in reality, a lot of people are wanting to see what happens as we move through into September, October and recovery. Um, and what do the earnings of a business that's adapted its model look like on a sustainable basis once the world recovers? Because at the moment, you might be doing really, really well, but you've got a COVID spike, which means you've got some one-off profit that doesn't happen again. Um, or you're trading really, you know, in a really tough environment you haven't yet picked up. Um, so working out what that COVID adjusted level of profitability is and therefore how you value a company is it's actually quite complicated. and overlay some furlough and some rent reductions and stuff like that it's actually quite hard to work out how much money a business is really making um, or investing at the moment so yeah. i think that, did, would, would, you, would you say that um, um, organizations who are acquiring at the moment are really interested in businesses who have got cash in the bank and cash reserves or who have made a, a commitment to invest through this to open up new markets and do clever different things what, what would be more attractive to to the the the, the cash that you, you see around at the moment? Um, well, I think investing in technology and new systems and processes is important because I think we've all been talking about change coming in the recruitment market for a while and you know this is forcing people to work more virtually and perhaps not even have office space again 
um, and using technology in a different way. So those that are investing in technology and efficient processes um, are definitely more attractive. Um, those that are sticking to their niche specialism, specialism but expanding out into other adjacent areas um, within that domain you know, will be attractive and they're growing. Um, and geographic footprints, you've got more of a spread around this country, but also around Europe, even to the US. Uh, not so sure about Asia, but certainly into the US, there's a lot of opportunity there as well. Um, and there's no substitute for investing in good people. Um, and at the end Which, of the day, a good recruitment business has got lots of good people in, and that's really what makes them tick. I'm guessing you'll say avoid China right now. I'm saying avoid China for the moment. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely. I mean, it's, it's an interesting marketplace. A lot of people have pulled in, but yeah, you probably wouldn't want to be there for long right now. Um, um, well, you know, with, if you look at um, Beijing Career International coming out the other way, you know, actually the Chinese are looking to spend money outside of China to grow. So it's an interesting pot of capital, um, but not an interesting place to expand to for, for as a business for the time being, I would say. Well, that's a really interesting dynamic because there was a Chinese over here looking to acquire businesses and there was quite a lot of money thrown around. The multiples were, were fantastic. Um, yeah. would, would you want to be owned by Chinese or have partners who are Chinese right now? Would yes, good question. It's a good question. Um, I think the guys that invested, I found that partnership quite productive and I think they found them quite supportive and that's, you know, in the sector, that's probably the only real example of any note. Um, and I think those that have been owned by the Japanese have also had a similar experience where they've been quite supportive um, backers of businesses and they have been supporting investments. So, you know, take away the China political dynamic out of it. They've actually been quite good investors and keen to grow. And um, are there any new players coming to market is, or is it literally, is, is the, the same old faces at the moment? who knows what's going to happen post covid but uh, who, who's out there is it um institutional pe banks money or, or is there a lot of private money looking at um and nicking some distressed businesses uh i think it's a mixture so i think the the same old same old list of trade buyers are still there um but their m a strategies are still evolving and they're not really clear what they you know what they want to do next and you know, when they will be able to go on an m a trail again um, there are a few private equity backed businesses around the world that are looking to actively grow. Um, there's a couple in France and you know, it's got to happen at some point, but the American private equity backed recruiters have got to start coming over here. Um, and there's a couple of those around. Um, the Japanese are still feeling quite strong, so they're still out there. Uh, private equity for the right businesses in the right markets is definitely still out there and they can be supported by debt. Um, but there's probably still a good chunk of the recruitment world that's not attractive to investment for the time being. Just given the dynamics and some of the pain that people are suffering at the moment can, can i talk about scale as well and you know at, at what levels people get more interested there, there's there's a few of our members as rdlc who get on brilliantly their businesses uh there's loads of synergy between them they could they could quite simply just shake hands and merge to give scale and substance so they could reduce back office cost to get to some magic numbers where, where, where are the trigger points that that sort of make other people more interested yeah, I think less than a million pounds worth of EBITDA, you know, becomes very challenging for M&A for anybody, um, be that a trade buyer or be it a private equity fund where you're typically too small. You know, as soon as you start to hit four or five million pounds worth of EBITDA, it becomes very interesting for mid-market private equity and it starts to make a difference for most trade buyers. That's, that's where the switch normally takes, takes place. Um, right. Uh, and what would you, if, if there are people at the moment who are thinking, you know, I, I, a lot of people say to me, I've got a three year plan, I've got a five year plan. And I just think, yeah, that's never going to happen. Um, if, if, um, if someone wanted to go through a process like this, what are the things that they should be mindful of or considering doing today that might get them closer down the line to achieve those goals? Um, well, the number one thing I think for any, for any shareholder who's heavily involved in their business um, is to think about that transition to the next generation. So making sure you've got the right senior team in place. If your objective as an owner, manager, founder, entrepreneur is to make some money and get some liquidity and leave the business ultimately, then you need to make sure you've got a proper team in place. Um, and that transition from owner, manager, who's got all the magic dust of their own DNA over a business, stepping away and handing the reins to the next team, it's a, it's a big, big step and not to be underestimated. So that's, you know, that's always the first thing that I would say. Um, I think that investment in technology piece will become more and more prevalent. So having a strategy around technology um, is definitely an important part of that. Um, I would say, stay true to yourselves, to that niche specialism that you'll have developed your business in. It's easy to look at opportunities at the end of your nose, which might generate short term cash, but probably devalue the business overall because you've lost your focus. So I think stay focused would be 
number three. Um, and number four is tight financial management. And one of the areas that people often lose value in a deal is around the balance sheet and it's around cash and it's around working capital and it's around invoice discounting um, and managing those things tightly to make sure you can maximize the cash you take out of the business. And that is, a, is another big piece. And I guess the final one would be, this is a question you always ask me, Gary, and there's no right or wrong answer is what's the optimal mix of temporary and permanent in, in your, in your profit and your revenue. Um, you know, the current market we're in, um, in general, the perm world has got a bit harder and in, in general, the temp and flexible world has got, you know, more interesting again. Um, so making sure that mix, you know, whether it's 50, 50 or 60 and 40 in flavor of temps, um, you know, I think ever more is, is a more important thing to do in terms of mix of business. Um, and one of the things that we talk about quite a lot is, is the story, it's having, having a plan, having a vision that you both, you know, there's a story internally, a story to your clients and a story to your investor community that, 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 that they, they see. So I think Sean Wasworth absolutely crushed it with the story that he got. Uh, Nigel Frank, you know, we, we owned the dynamics market. We, we yeah. haven't really touched contracts in this and just think we can take this model, this machine and do it everywhere else. That was brilliant. Do you do any work? So if, if someone were to engage with you, um, and I'm, I'm assuming you'd like to get engaged at least two or three years before any event, eventual exercise um, event, how do you work with people to help create that story and, and that's that energy that that is believable and it's got some truth and substance to it some it's got truth and substance to it yeah i think creating it and delivering it is really <coughs> it's really powerful when people look back and do their due diligence so i think that i think that's spot on um you know we typically get very engaged in the six to 12 months before an exit event and start to get you know more up to speed with the business and helping people out two to three years from you know from that point um, and there's a process of going through the business planning to make sure you're hitting the end objective. So we would always start and say, you know, Gary, you've got a great business. You're thinking of selling it in three years time. Uh, you know, what's your end game? What do you want out of it? What size of business? What's your magic number in terms of value, et cetera, et cetera. So you can start to get the objectives. Um, and then you start to build a business plan to fit those objectives. Um, and that is about telling a story and it's which markets you're in and why, where's the growth coming from? Why, what's the competitive landscape look like? How do you match up against them in terms of USPs? You know, what about your team? Have you got the right people in your team? Have you got a loyal consultant base or have you got high churn? You know, what's the culture of a business look like? Um, and all of that flows then into the financials and where you want to invest money and place your chips. Um, I'm telling that story, and describe is, it's great. And it's rare to achieve that, actually. He's done a fantastic job there. But, um, you know, you, you can't get there unless you've got a clear plan to get there. A hundred percent. And if you were to give so advisors, um, recruitment business leaders, one bit of advice right now in this moment in time, when you know the future is more balls than crystal, nobody really knows what's going to happen next. But what would your bit of advice be? You know, if they're looking at maximising their value and at some point wanting to run off into a, a sunset, what what might that be? I think hold your nerve would be my would my most piece of advice because the world, you know, it's a it's a unprecedented period of time um, but it will come back um, so I think holding your nerve um, you know, continuing to invest at the right time without putting yourself under cash pressure you know in people and in client client term relationships making sure you've got that longevity and that trust both with consultants and with clients but um, you know hold your nerve on that and the market will come back um, you know, I'm going to take one more question from you and thank you for doing this by the way uh, yeah. just just what one one final question People have got cash in the bank at the moment. They haven't had to spend money. They've had the furlough cash. They've taken their C bills and their bounce back loans. Um, they've been collecting all the cash from their customers. They're actually financially all right. If you were to look somebody in the whites of their eyes and say, use that money to invest in tech, the future, new markets, or keep it for a rainy day, as, as a very level-headed thinker, what might you say to people? Um. It sounds like I'm sitting on the vents, but I would I would balance the two things. So I would definitely keep some cash in the bank for a rainy day. Um, so I might preserve half of my cash to make sure I've got some rainy day cash. Um, but I'd have a very clear and focused investment strategy on the two or three areas that I think were most important to me to invest in. Um, and that means different things for different people in different industries. But you know, investing in people, investing in technology, um, you know, investing in marketing to make sure you're capturing a really cool client base. You know, they're all very valid things to spend money on. Um, I certainly wouldn't go all in and I wouldn't spend all of my cash on investment. I definitely want to keep a, 
a decent chunk, perhaps up to half of it in, you know, in my back pocket for a rainy day. I finally say the all in. I don't think I'd ever play poker with you because I'll be all in every 20 minutes and we'll just see what happens. Yeah. Um, Mark Sarcher, thank you very much for giving us your time today. Uh, you're the busiest man and the most level-headed. Um, always give us brilliant advice. Uh, thank you very much. Really appreciate you doing this. Um, yeah, you hope, hopefully I'll see you soon, sir. Yeah, well. catch up soon. Right, brilliant. That was brilliant, buddy. Thank you so much for doing that. Hard okay. and fast, absolutely perfect. Um, Problem. And it was, uh, it was, it was really good. I, I owe you one. I, I probably owe you about five now. Thank you very much. Hopefully, see you soon, bud. That's right. We'll do a nice lunch in September, October when we're. Um, I'm coming uh, back in town now. Actually, one or two days a week. So, you know, as as and when uh, you fancy uh, an escape of a of a nice lunch, then just let me know because I'm going to be in town probably Tuesdays and Thursdays a lot of weeks. Well, I'm out and about. I'm, I'm doing board meetings. We did our first lunch um, last Friday, but okay. we had so many people there, we couldn't take any pictures because it wasn't very socially distanced. Um, <laughs> so we couldn't promote it. See you soon, bud. Yeah, see you soon. Bye-bye.